First, I would like to uh, thank my wife, Verena, who was co-investigator on uh, the Swiss MDMA PTSD study and also um, contributed a great deal to the thoughts that I will present to you. When Rick Doblin invited me to present the results of the Swiss study of MDMA PTSD uh, psychotherapy at this conference, uh, I told him I would rather speak about the essence of psychotherapy. I should have known better than to argue with Rick about such things. <laughs> I, I ended up now giving two talks. The one first requested and now this one. I must confess that I consider this talk the more important of the two. Psychedelic therapy is close to my heart and this talk is meant to be a personal overview of how I understand that psychedelic therapy works. My presentation applies to the clinical therapeutic setting with patients who have psychiatric diagnosis such as trauma related and other anxiety disorders, depression or personality disorders and so on. What I have to say is derived from my own experience in psychedelic training therapy as a psychedelic therapy trainee and co-therapist, all made under institutionally sanctioned conditions in Switzerland from 1986 to 1993. I also draw upon the extensive experience gathered during this time by my colleagues from the Swiss Medical Association for Psychedelic Therapy and of course through the experience with the Swiss MDMA PTSD study and in the exchange with the Mithervers while the, our study was going on. I will show a slide with references at the end of my presentation. I would like to cover the topic by modifying the well-known triad dose set setting. In my view, there are four distinct variables that influence the course of the psychedelic experience and therapy. First, the method, whoops. First, the method itself. Second, the patient with his symptoms and problems, individual psychodynamics, biography, beliefs, expectations, and fears. Third, the therapist with his personality, therapeutic background and style, beliefs, expectations, and blind spots. And fourth, the therapeutic or healing process itself. All of them have to be taken into account when considering effects and outcome of psychedelic therapy. I would like to start with the method. Basically, I understand psychedelic therapy as a substance-assisted psychotherapy, meaning that the psychotherapeutic process is catalyzed by interspersing substance-assisted sessions to a traditional psycho non-drug psychotherapy. The substances I have found most suitable for psychedelic therapy are MDMA and LSD. Psilocybin, mescaline, and DMT can be considered as alternatives to LSD. Psychedelic therapy ideally begins after a non-preparatory, after a preparatory non-drug phase with a series of MDMA sessions followed later by a hallucinogen if needed. I will explain this in detail later. I consider the group setting as far more rewarding and also more economical than individual sessions for the majority of the clinical problems that can be treated with psychedelic therapy. The group setting offers us a lot of social support as well as the experience of what community or family could really feel like. A group also provides multiple transference possibilities that can be utilized in the th therapeutic process. The psychedelic group experience further intensifies and deepens the individual process. Individual sessions can make sense in specific situations, for example, when a patient doesn't have sufficient group skills or is too anxious in regard to a group experience, or when it can be foreseen that he will need one-on-one -on -one support. But even then, such patients may be integrated in a group by providing them with a personal sitter within the group. 
ample time should be allowed between drug-assisted sessions for the integration of the psychedelic experience. It can take up to two to three months to integrate a single, a single drug-assisted session. Three to four drug-assisted sessions per year usually yield abundant psychodynamic material to deal with and integrate in between sessions. Peter Gasso showed in his 1996 retrospective studies of 107 therapies during the periods sanctioned by Swiss regulatory authorities that a mean number of about seven drug-assisted sessions over a period of three years led to slight or good clinical improvement in nine out of ten cases. At the Breaking Convention Conference in Canterbury 2011, Friederike Meckel-Fischer a Swiss psychedelic therapist reported a number of at least 30 drug-assisted sessions needed for in-depth clinical improvement. As a rule of thumb, the more ill a patient is in the sense of psychopathology, especially structural and personality pathology, the more drug-assisted sessions will be required. Most patients seen in everyday psychotherapeutic practice have a long history of suffering, often beginning in early childhood, and with deeply rooted dysfunctional, emotional, cognitive, and behavioral patterns that are very resistant to change. Psychedelic therapy can shorten the, the duration of therapy by enabling the patient in the first phase to build a trusting working relationship with the therapist within no time. Simultaneously, it initiates, catalyzes, intensifies, and deepens the psychotherapeutic process. In my view, the actual healing process comprises the learning of new, more mature, functional, and sustainable patterns at its own speed. These, those processes cannot be accelerated by, by psychedelic therapy. The therapist should have a broad repertoire of interventions to pace and guide sessions. Interventions are required in particular in situations in which patients become emotionally overwhelmed, dissociate or freeze, resist the process, or get into trouble which they cannot handle by themselves. This includes group interventions, the playing of music, and on, on the individual level, body work and verbal psychotherapeutic interventions. Very important for patients who have been neglected and traumatized in infancy and childhood are emotionally corrective and restructuring interventions involving body contact and touch, holding them, cuddling, and soothing by the therapist. The patient is then encouraged to, exploring, to explore his body and feel it in a new self-loving and accepting way. Music is an exceedingly potent tool which the therapist should apply with great care and understanding its deeply evocative nature. Under the influence of psychedelics, music powerfully influ influences mood and emotions, activates or attenuates the ongoing individual and group process. Verbal interventions can include, apart from the usual psychotherapeutic interventions, humming, and singing, storytelling, reciting poems, and much more. The danger of verbal intervention is leading the patient onto the intellectual level instead of keeping him in the process of experiencing. Talking should therefore be kept to a minimum until late phases of the experience. Let me come to the second variable. Who is the ideal patient? He or she should be able to build a minimal trusting work relationship with the therapist. This is essential especially for psychedelic therapy. It ensures the safety of the patient and is the foundation to help and guide him or her through the confrontational phase. A therapist must therefore pay close attention to the attachment style and patterns of relationship of his patient. A patient must be willing to confront himself, his conflicts, his deepest fears, traumatic memories, and be willing to question his beliefs. He must consider facing inconvenient truths about himself and significant others during therapy. 
Having gone through traditional psychotherapy previously is helpful but not mandatory. The patient must also be informed that every therapy has side effects. For example, the worsening, the temporary worsening of sim symptoms or unanticipated developments such as divorce. In an outpatient setting, patients additionally burdened with severe multiple psychosocial problems such as unemployment, turmoil of separation and divorce, social isolation, financial problems and so on can easily be overstressed by the intensity of the psychedelic process. Such patients need to be stabilized first. The third variable is the therapist himself. The importance of therapist variables for the outcome of psychotherapy is widely recognized. The patient-therapist relationship accounts for at least 30% of psychotherapy outcome. In regard to psychedelic therapy, the impact of the therapist has been largely underestimated up to now by focusing all too much on the fascinating subjective effects of the psychedelics on the mind. On the next two slides, I listed some of the important therapist traits that have to be considered. They include on the personal level age, gender, ethnic orange, and cultural background, coping patterns, emotional well-being, values, and beliefs. And on the professional background of the therapist, there are traits such as his basic training in psychotherapy, his therapeutic style, his ability to maintain and establish, to establish and maintain a therapeutic relationship, uh, training in psychedelic therapy, including self-exploration with substances under supervision and in a therapeutic session. Carl Rogers once said, quote, one comes to the somewhat uncomfortable conclusion that the more psychologically mature and integrated the therapist is as a person, the more helpful is the relationship he provides. This puts a heavy demand on the therapist as a person, unquote. The patient-therapist interaction under the influence of psychedelics is even more demanding and delicate than in traditional psychotherapy. Why is this? A patient emerges into an altered state of consciousness, characterized by enhanced perception in all qualities, which includes the perception of the therapist. The therapist and his interactions become transparent to the patient who dares to take a close look. Patients can virtually read the therapist, providing they are not too busy with their own process. <laughs> they react to him consciously or unconsciously. A therapist who is not at terms with his own weaknesses and unresolved issues will not fool psychedelic patients and will get in the way in the, th uh, in the therapeutic process. The psychedelic therapist has multiple functions. Sometimes he's a midwife, helping, supporting, and soothing as a patient goes through painful experiences, waiting for the birth of the true, authentic self. Sometimes he is a teacher, conveying the rules of life and relationship, instructing on how to endure intense emotions and how to get the best out of a trip. Sometimes he is a witness to the injuries and injustices that have been imposed on the patient in the past. Sometimes he's just a compassionate human being willing to share the here and now, the stillness and the bliss. Sometimes he is a therapist confronting and mirroring the patient. Sometimes he is a guide through the frightening and unknown territories of consciousness, knowing that they will come back safely in due time. Sometimes he will be object of the patient's intense needs and projections, his attempts to seduce and manipulate. And mind you, the session is not over after the usual 50 minutes. Because psychedelic therapy can lead to the most frightening and puzzling areas of the psyche, the therapies need a comprehensive map, there you go, of consciousness. This involves all aspects of the individual, collective, and cultural being. 
He must recognize perinatal problems and, of course, be familiar with all aspects of individual and systemic psychology and their pathology. He must also feel comfortable with the transpersonal and spiritual dimension. Restricting the interpretation of a given substance-induced experience to one perspective, for example, the psychoanalytical, you will possibly miss other perspectives and roots of problems. A psychedelic therapist must also be aware of his own assumptions of where the psychedelic process leads, as well as his personal expectations and beliefs. These definitely influence the patient, especially if they are not reflected or openly declared. He has to be a trained psychotherapist to be able to train in psychedelic therapy. Because of the extraordinary range of experiences possible, and the high demand on the therapist are considered mandatory that a therapist experiences the drug-induced altered states of consciousness under supervision and in a therapeutic settings as part of his training. He must have visited the important places on his own map of consciousness himself. For example, experienced uh, the experience of dying. In summary, Psychedelic therapy requires a high degree of professionalism, maturity, and integrity of the therapist. Let me come to the therapeutic process. As in psychotherapy, psychedelic therapy should begin with an introductory phase in which problems, goals, and resources are explored. A comprehensive, multidimensional diagnosis and treatment plan is formulated, and a trusting therapeutic relationship is established. This phase should include informing the patient very carefully about the nature of the psychedelic process, the side effects, and what can be expected. It is very important to address concerns and fears about the substances, for example, the fear of losing control or going crazy. The more secure a patient feels in the setting offered and outlined by the therapist, the better he can surrender to the psychedelic experience. The more informed and familiar the therapist is with his patient, the more he can feel comfortable and be cash, compassionate and mindful. This takes time, so there is no need to hurry with the first session. There are several, several different aspects within the therapeutic process that the therapist should continuously keep track of. As I have mentioned, an average of three to four sessions a year is sufficient in most cases. Two frequent sessions without sufficient integration of the experience into daily life will result in illusions and disappointment in the long run. The pace and the length of the therapy have to be adjusted to the degree of the illness. Structuring and guiding, actively guiding sessions is crucial. Why? Because this helps to keep the experience safe and efficient. It also view, avoids meandering through the rambling realms of consciousness without effectively dealing with a patient's problems. Here again, a higher degree of illness requires more active guidance. Conversely, the healthier a patient is, the more non-directive a therapist can be. In my opinion, the first psychedelic experience is of utmost importance. It's the same as the first patient-therapist encounter in traditional psychotherapy. As conditions and directions of the psychotherapy are set right at the beginning, and if mistakes are made then, much time will be needed to correct them. As I said before, I very much recommend beginning psychedelic therapy with MDMA. MDMA is most likely to give a positively charged emotional cognitive experience. It reinforces the therapeutic relationship and thus primes follow-up sessions. MDMA doesn't overwhelm and isn't as confronting as a classic hallucinogen. MDMA makes it easier for the patient to let go and learn to trust the psychedelic process. Sessions go much deeper, gain intensity, and are more productive if they are structured and guided. A goal for a session gives focus, aligns the experience, and reduces distraction. A set of instructions on how to deal with the phenomena of the psychedelic experience 
help the patient reduce the fear of losing control and the danger of re-traumatization. Instructions are like a handrail and help the patient to navigate and take maximum advantage of the psychedelic experience. I prefer a meditative approach, instructing patients to keep eyes closed as much as possible, attention directed inwards to keep the body as still as possible, to try to observe or witness the unfolding process without acting directly upon thoughts, emotions, or body sensations, and just allow things to happen and stay in the process of experience. If a patient gets lost, confused, or anxious because of the process becoming too intense or overwhelming, I guide him to refocus by putting his or my hand on his heart, directing his attention to that spot, and for him to resume experiencing and observing. This is a very ambitious, and anyone who has tried meditating knows how difficult it is to concentrate on breathing in and out for more than half a minute. It's the same here, and of course, everybody fails and gets lost from time to time. A next aspect is the monitoring of the individual narrative, the trauma hotspots and central conflicts. The therapist helps associate and bring together the bits and pieces of the puzzle in the sense of building a comprehensive and conscious understanding of the symptoms, the past and the present. Another important aspect is the thinking process. LSD generally activates thinking more than MDMA. People who are very rational or have problems allowing themselves to feel often use thinking as a defense mechanism. They must be actively guided into the feeling process. They have to discover that thinking is just a description of what is happening and not the experience itself. They can thus discover that they are much more than only thoughts. On the other hand, psychedelic therapy has the potential to activate and reveal deeply rooted dysfunctional beliefs and convictions which can then be confronted and questioned. Another aspect is the group process. The therapist has to actively structure and lead the group as a whole. Many interpersonal problems such as projections or transference phenomena are amplified and become clearly visible in psychedelic group sessions. Subjects and issues that are introduced by individual patients reverberate through the group in a very strong way. Often deeply rooted symptoms originating in pre-verbal childhood are unconsciously put on stage in the group and the group can then be of help to resolve the problem. The central aspect of the psychedelic process where healing comes best visible is the flow of emotions and feelings. Many, if not most, of the patients are in some way not in charge of or incapable to regulate their feelings and emotions. They can be either suppressed or be avoided, or they are unbearable or lead to uncontrolled reactions. There is a natural tendency of the psyche to resolve problems or conflicts, and this tendency is catalyzed and amplified by psychedelic substances. The simultaneous perception of emotions and feelings is enhanced considerably. The resulting self-confrontational psychodynamic process, intimately connected to feelings and emotions, is activated and intensified as a whole. The therapist should monitor and, facilitate, monitor and facilitate the development or flow of emotions and feelings by means of what I call the cascade of emotions and feelings. Egoistical and aggressive emotions such as anger, scorn, envy, jealousy, etc. are an expression of and resolve into feelings of fear, need and injury such as feeling abandoned lonely, helpless, ashamed, etc. These eventually turn into sadness if they are not fought off. Once sadness arises, it is usually linked to a personal concern. I am sad because of this or that. If the person who is experiencing deep sadness completely surrenders to the sadness, he then experiences what you might call a depersonalization of the sadness. 
Sadness because of gives way to sadness without a cause. This is always, this is always linked to a release of muscular tension at that point. If he resists surrendering, the experience tends to become very compelling and fearful to the point of mortal fear. Under the influence of a hallucinogen, this can become an even more powerful experience, activating the perinatal mattresses with death-rebirth experiences. Under the influence of MDMA, it has more opening of the heart quality. This is the central moment of healing where the problem resolves in the sense of complete understanding and acceptance. Now, the deepest origin of the sadness becomes visible, which is love. This happens in any kind of psychotherapy, but is especially well visible in psychedelic therapy. Such moments are always very moving and precious and compared to the experience of a birth. The essence of psychedelic therapy can best be experienced and understood with the help of MDMA. I dare say that the history of psychedelic therapy would have gone in a slightly different direction if our psychedelic elders could have experienced and worked with MDMA at the same time as with LSD. Under MDMA, the patient is able to experience and understand what centering in the heart means. It means learning to look at the world from the perspective of the heart. This is a highly active and deliberate, observational, empathic and compassionate, non-judgmental and non-defensive process. I see this as the major gift or the essence of the MDMA experience. Being completely centered in the heart consists of two distinct elements. The first is being in the state of stillness. Stillness means observing without reacting to what is appearing in consciousness. Thoughts, feelings, pictures, bodily sensations. Just letting these things pass through the perceptual field. The second part is a movement of attention which is directed outwards, away from the observer, to the other and the world out there, and into the next moment. Following this movement means to forget and not bother about oneself, the ego and its needs. Together, the stillness and this movement can be called the state of love, not to be mistaken with feelings of love. What greater gift can you imagine? Once a patient has begun to discover and acknowledge this principle by having gone through the process many times, he will eventually get a notion of what the central theme of human life called love is all about, how it governs and organizes life and relationships in particular. If he decides to follow these principles, and again, this is a decision by choice, he can then remodel his life and relationships. The controversial German psychotherapist Bert Hellinger wrote a book with the German title Ordnungen der Liebe, which translates to something like orders of love. I like this expression because it captures the essence of the lesson to be learned in psychedelic therapy, especially with MDMA. Once the patient has learned to center in the heart, he is ready for the hallucinogens. Using the heart as a navigation tool, he is able to weather the infinite dimensions of consciousness which the classic hallucinogens can unleash. Centering in the heart is therefore the conditio sine qua non for healing, for dealing effectively and sustainably with problems and symptoms, for cognitive and emotional restructuring, and for personal growth and maturity. The psychedelic substances can only show the way. The patient has then to set out for the changes in life by himself, practicing and learning, in order to become a more whole, integrated, and authentic person. Or, as St. Augustine said, love and do what you want. Thank you very much.